Hello and welcome to Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 36, Wedding Bells from Hamilton, Ontario. I'm Sean and here with me, live from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to say hi to everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. We start here live every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop and continue on even after the double bell ends the show for more Off the Books After Show. Uh, today, we're talking about the potential of having board games at a wedding. Remember to stick around after the main topic for more gaming content. Today, I'm going to take a look at Race for the Galaxy 10 years in. I've got some more plays of Builders of Blankenberg with the expansion and a look at a new game, Cypress Legacy. And I've got not nearly enough gaming. <laughs> We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. We're here for you. Each week, we're going to highlight some of those discussions, feedback we've received, comments on our content, gaming discussions we've been part of. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions. And if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-M. You can also hit us up on social media where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. This week, we're taking a look at some comments on our Gloomhaven videos. Uh, Mines or M. Hines 007 writes, Love the video, but the potion comment caught me off guard. I thought the rules say you can only have one item in each slot, head, shirt, and feet. But for things like potions, you can only have the number of potions, items, equal to half your level rounded up. I can see that you guys have three to four potions at level four. If I'm mistaken, please correct me. Uh, you know, I, I knew that rule at one point. I remember figuring that out at one point, but somehow over the last couple of weeks, I think we started thinking that it was one small item per level and not level divided by two rounding up. Um, this was left on a video for our first random dungeon playthrough. Now, at that point, I think... I think I was level five, but that still would only allow for three potions, not four. I got to admit, I didn't go back and actually look through the video. So now I am pretty sure, yeah, I think the last couple games we did mix that up. I think we were thinking it was your level number of small items. Now, one clarification, you can own as many small items as you want. So they noted uh, in the comment that you can only have one item in each slot for this. No, you can own as many as you want, but you can only use your level divided by two rounded up each scenario. So you can bring in 80 potions, but you can only use at level six, say three potions. Uh, it's definitely something we'll have to watch for our next play, which we should be playing this Friday. So it's something I'll bring up with the whole group, uh, of which three of us are here right now. So a cat attack is in the chat room, probably going, oh my God, we played that wrong too. Now, another comment from Ryan Toxopius who wrote, it's cool that there's a random dungeon as well as campaigns. I need to find a group here that plays it so I can give it a try. Now, this is one of those things that many people don't seem to realize is even a part of the game. As well loved as this game is, between the confusions about rules and printings and simple lack of knowledge about the game aspects, I just don't understand why this game, as good as it is, is ranked as high as it is. Um, it's just got some issues. Um, but... <clears throat> Moving on, uh, Temujin has taken the time to comment on a couple of our Gloomhaven videos. They pointed out that things like moving bad guys when there is no place they could attack their focused target, uh, that rolling modifiers are ignored with disadvantage, and making, you, and making sure that you account for the fact that enemies can move through each other when determining focus and where they will move. Yeah, I personally wanted to include this and thank Temujin for their time and attention to detail on this. Uh, they were even cool enough. There was on at least two videos. I think it was three where they even put down timestamps so I could quickly look at the the complaint or the, the the error they're pointing out and go right to the video to watch it and go, oh, yep, you're right. That's exactly where I made the mistake. So thank you for those corrections, Temujin. As usual, if you see us do something wrong during the live stream or any time we live stream any games, right now that's Gloomhaven's on Friday nights. But if we do any games, point it out, please. Uh, it's it's a 54-page rule book with lots of weird little rules and lots of things you can easily forget. Uh, we want to play by the correct rules. So, And I don't mind getting 
comments like this and realizing we're doing something wrong so we can fix it going forward. We record the show live Wednesday nights at 9.30 Eastern on Twitch, and we encourage people to drop in and take part in our chat room, The Lobby. Don't forget, if you're here live, we continue the show after the Double Bell in an off-the-books after show, as well as some special features that might make it on YouTube. Thanks to our moderator, and tonight, well, Oops. and tonight she did manage to get into the uh, chat room just in time, and she games. Uh, tonight in the chat, we've got Kat and Danielle, Tech, Teldern, uh, I think that's all the names I've seen pop up so far. Thanks for joining us, folks. Yeah, thank you very much for coming out. It is definitely appreciated. Now, our main topic today is gaming at weddings. So what I want to hear from those of you in the lobby tonight is if anyone's ever done it. Have you gamed at a wedding, at a reception? Oh, I assume probably at the reception, not the wedding, but you never know. How about during that downtime between the ceremony and the reception? Say when they're done the gaming thing during a wedding. If you're... Uh... Depending on the wedding, I suppose there could be gambling at least during the ceremony <laughs> itself. <laughs> I guess that's or, possible. Or prior to. Uh, my wife was significantly late to our uh, our ceremony because the car broke down, so I'm willing to bet there were some people betting whether or not it was happening then. Probably uh, true. We did not game at Sean's wedding. We did not game at my wedding. We are here to answer one or more of your game, gaming or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Our social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Well, the best way to get questions to us is through the website. We're not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. This week, we are answering a question from Zach Armstrong, who went over to tabletopbellhop.com and clicked on Ask the Bellhop, where he wrote, We're getting married soon. And for the reception, while the wedding party gets photos taken, we want to put out some board games for the guests to play to pass the hour or so. What kinds of games and setup would work well to make this a success? Well, thank you very much for the question, Zach. I do think I have some suggestions that will help you out. I do hope that it's not too late and you haven't already gotten hitched. So I guess that sounds like that made it came out wrong. Hopefully we're not getting to this question too late for Zach here, but I think it's worth talking about for anyone else too. So this past weekend, Deanna and I attended the wedding of Tori and Kat, names you should recognize from our Gloomhaven live streams. While getting ready for the wedding, there was one point where I actually turned to Deanna. I was like, should we bring some games? And Dee's like, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. I'm not sure. Now, Tori and Kat are both gamers. I knew of two other people that would be at the wedding that we'd be sitting with, uh, Eugene and Neil, who were also gamers. But from what I knew of the other guests, there probably weren't going to be many other people there that are going to be interested in gaming. So I strongly considered it, but eventually decided against it. Now, once there... There were a few points, I admit, I wish I'd packed something, like just a simple card game or possibly Azul. Based on the vibe at this wedding, like people were uh, dancing and doing all kinds of things. I don't think anyone would have minded if the table off in the corner were overplaying video games while everyone else was bouncing up and down to whatever hip hop song I'd never heard before in my entire life. I don't think it would have been an issue at all. Now, uh, that isn't quite what Zach's asking. Now, it's definitely what inspired me to tackle this question, because what Zach's looking for is games to be played between the wedding and or sorry, the, the ceremony reception here. I'm thinking about games at the reception, but I was going through my list of questions. I'm like, come on, this is perfect. Like we just did the wedding thing last weekend. So I'm thinking this is a perfect topic to follow up with. Uh, speaking of Tori and Kat, Kat is in the chat room, so you can all wish her congratulations while she's in there. It was a great wedding. We did have a great time. So going back to Zach's question, he's talking about setting something up for that period where, where like the friends and the family and, and the, the, the newlyweds are going to go and get pictures taken or whatever, right? There's always that gap. So he's thinking of playing games then. And what's kind of funny about that is when we got to the wedding and we met up with Eugene and Neil, we're like, what'd you guys do? And they're like, oh, we went to Joe's and played Fallout. So there's definitely gamers that are going to be interested in this. Because at the same time, I got home and I was doing some online stuff and I ended up playing a game of Carcassonne with Sean on Board Game Arena. I, I got to say, I, I like it. I dig it. I think it is a great idea. 
Um, the thing is, though, is you got to figure out how to make it work, right? Um, one of the things that's important is you've got to pick the right games. But not only that, you need to pick games people will play and get people interested in playing those games. So I want to talk about that second part first. Ways to make the games make people want to play the games after that though we'll get into one of my typical list of game suggestions which of course will be broken down by category now i love this idea there's often so much downtime on your special day while the bride and groom may be kept busy with photographers and whatnot other guests not in the wedding party will often appreciate something to do uh, mm -hmm. i do have one suggestion though if you're the ones getting married find someone <laughs> else to take care of it your wedding tends to be overly stressful, even if you work hard to try and avoid anything big and fancy. And just getting a friend to manage a non-essential aspect like that can be vital to your health, both physical and mental. Yeah, that's a really good point. I totally agree. If, if you maybe have one of the, the bridesmaids or the groomsmen not stay around for pictures and get a couple pictures done, or just get someone to volunteer. So... The main thing I want to start with here is getting people to actually play the games, wherever this is, whether this is at the reception or in the period in between or whatever. Well, the, the wife's trying on dresses or something, wherever you're going to put your games at your event. The thing is, you have to remove the intimidation factor, right? We're gamers. Uh, we I'm, I assume most of the people who are listening to this are also gamers. There's actually something a little strange in us and that is the fact we get excited about learning new games some people more than others now not everyone's like this most people are going to be way more comfortable playing something they already know now especially true in a social situation like a wedding where you're surrounded by a mix of family friends and strangers that's why i think in this case some of the best games for this kind of event are the games we all grew up playing and already know how to play now, it's not going to be very often you're going to hear me on this particular podcast talking about mass market games, but this is the one situation where I think they fit. Now, the next step up is games that are really simple to learn. Like, I want games that you can summarize their rules on one page so you can leave that piece of paper out, that page out with the copy of the game on the table. You wanna even better get it down to like index card size or say a playing card sized card, two-sided, right? Anything more than that, the game's too complicated. If you can't summarize the rules on a credit card two sides or a business card two sides, pick something simpler. Cause you want people to be able to pick up these rules and read them in moments and know how to play. No one's gonna wanna sit and flip through a rule book, not at a wedding. People are there to have fun and socialize. Now, even better than rule summaries, though, is kind of what I alluded at earlier, is find someone to teach the games, right? Find a game teacher. We got an entire article on finding a game teacher. Maybe even go to the local game store and say, hey, do you have someone that can come out to our wedding to teach games? They'd probably be willing to do it. I know Ian's done stuff like that for birthday parties. Now, even better is have a few people that can teach games. Get some volunteers to help you out here. If you have to take five minutes to teach um, Uncle John how to play the mind the week before the wedding, do it if he's willing to take on that responsibility once the wedding starts. Now, as when I mentioned back when we did our teaching games episode, right, when we talked about how to teach games and how we talked about how people learn, most people are going to learn by being shown how to play. And that's why you want to, if possible, have someone there to teach the games, right? Also have rule books out, have, sorry, summary sheets, have summary cards out, but if possible, get someone to teach it. Now, the next step is make the games look like they want to be played. Make them look inviting, right? Have them out on the tables. Don't just have a bunch of boxes piled up. In my opinion, you should have these games already set up, ready to play. Have the decks shuffled. Have the Jenga tower built. Have your rule summary sitting in plain view with the game. Have everything you need to play there. If the game needs you to keep score, there should be paper and pencil in your score sheet. If there's cards, make sure they're shuffled. If there's tiles, have the tiles laid out. If there's things that need to be stacked, have them stacked. Now, something not to be overlooked is setting expectations early. Let people know, let your guests know that there's going to be games at the event. Put it right in the invitation. In general, people don't like to be surprised. You don't want someone to walk out of the ceremony and be led into a room filled with tables on games going, whoa, whoa, what's this? What, now, now we did the wedding, now we got to play games with people? Uh, that could throw people off. People may not be comfortable with that. 
people are going to be more willing to take a chance if they know what's coming, if they're building up to it. You want to start selling it early and assure people they don't need to know the games. And then possibly most important, don't force anyone to play. Despite what we may think, it's not always the case that everyone's a gamer and they have don't know it yet. They just haven't found the right game. I've heard that before. I'm sorry, it's not actually true. Not everyone likes playing games. People have different pastimes. Now, I admit, as a gamer, I, I get that thought. I get that logical fallacy. I don't quite get it. Like, people should like games. How do you not like games? They're fun. I don't get it. But it's true. There's people out there that are not comfortable playing games. Plus, you have to realize that this is a wedding, right? It's a social event. There's already a lot of social pressure at such a gathering and forcing people to play games, especially with trained strangers, can just make that worse. Social awkwardness, snacks, alcohol, and those certain relatives you've got, and even just general discomfort in wearing a suit or a dress and high heels. These are all things that can impact people's interest mm -hmm. and ability to you know, enjoy a game. Yeah, you want the games there as an option, a way to pass time if people want to. That's the point of it. It's not, hey, now we sit down and we play games, you're forced to. No, you don't want it to become an obligation. You want it to be an option. So now moving on to picking the right games. So I kind of mentioned this in summary earlier, but you want quick, fun games that people already know or are very easy to learn. You want people laughing and having a good time. This is a wedding. It's a time of celebration. This is not the time to try to show off to all your family just how good Puerto Rico is. No, you want to be sitting there hearing people yell out Yahtzee and getting excited and clapping. And it's that type of game, right? You, you want the excitement, the social nature of it. So as usual, as we've done on any of these other recommendation episodes, we're going to break these recommendations into categories and list a few games in each of them. Now, there is no way this list is exhaustive. Even since I published the article, Deanna and I were talking about it, and there's like 30 games that I'm like, oh, you forgot this. Oh, I should have put that on the list. So these are just some of the best examples I could think of. But trust me, there are plenty more games that fit. Again, you want quick, simple, exciting games. So we start off with mass market games that most people already know and love. Yeah, a wedding, again, I, I mentioned this before. This is one of the few events where I am going to tell you to stick to mass market games. It's not often that I'm going to give game recommendations and bring up the stuff you can go get at your local Toys R Us or Walmart or wherever you get your local toys. The thing with these games is, is that most people already know how to play them. Plus, most people do have fond memories of them growing up, even if they're not the best games out there anymore. Now, not all of those mass market games are going to be appropriate. If you think a wedding is stressful, try playing Monopoly with relatives <laughs> between the ceremony and reception, mix in a little alcohol, and you could have quite the experience. Yeah, and then real gamer comes over and flips the table because they have money on uh, free parking. <laughs> so one of my first recommendations, I everyone's played this game, and that's Uno. I gotta admit, I like Uno. I, I have nothing against Uno. My kids like Uno. We actually have a copy in the glove box of our car, just in case we get stuck somewhere and need to entertain the kids. Uh, there's something about the take that nature of the game that has appealed to generations of families and gamers. Yeah, this one has always been a go-to for our kids and, and, you know, a great game for the family. Just watch out, though, as there are some differences between editions that have popped up. Uh, we actually have an anniversary edition that has these extra anniversary cards that uh, are actually like a, a uh, I forget what it is. It's like this car uh, or pick up eight or 12 or something like Oof. that. They're, it's, it's, it, they're just brutal. We, we take them out of the deck whenever possible. Uh, so, but just be aware that they, they, Uno isn't always just Uno anymore. They always try to, you know, value well, add somehow. They're trying to keep it fresh, I'm guessing, because the game hasn't changed in years and everyone already owns Uno. So how do we sell them a new version? I'm sure that's a big part of it. So up next, here's another one. This one I even love to see at coffee shops, and that is Connect Four. I got to admit, it's, it's not the best game. But when I walk in somewhere and there's a Connect Four board there and the pieces are ready to play, I find it really hard not to play. If I'm with Deanna and we go into a coffee shop, there's a Connect Four board there and no one else is touching it, there's a pretty good chance I'm going to go grab it and play, despite the fact that I may not be a huge fan of the game. There's just something about that blue plastic stand and black and red checker pieces that draws people in. Set this up and I bet you it's one of the first games to get played. 
it's a game that really satisfies that fiddling urge. The pieces feel good in your hand, and there's something really satisfying when you slide that little bottom and dump all those pieces out at the end. It's it's very much like Tic Tac Toe, but it's that step further. It's an actual game, unlike Tic Tac Toe, yeah. where you should just be getting cats games every time. What would be interesting too is there are some variants out there, and there's one I really want to try, but I don't know how to physically do it with the, the at least the Mattel Hasbro. Actually, I don't know who makes Connect Four, probably Hasbro or Mattel, where instead you have two choices every turn. So you're going to put in a checker. The option is to take one of your checkers out of the bottom. And that just sounds really neat. But I don't know the physicality of how you do that with the standard sliding because you dump that thing and all the pieces fall out. But the, the concept of it sounds really good. If you were to put in a, a rubber, um, two, li two little rubber sort of uh, weather strips, then you'd be able to push it down through that and they shouldn't all fall out. Just the one. Yes, that might work. One out. Uh, if but I were, it does build sound if like I were building good. it, I'd go that way. It just sounds like a cool variant to make it a bit more of a, a strategy game instead of so random. And there's even better versions where you play where you it's blindfolded and so on. But that's pushing it a bit far for the whole wedding thing. <laughs> um, I know a lot of people that love word games. So one of I'm, the one I picked is Boggle. The main reason is because it's small, right? You don't you don't want to another thing with a wedding, right? We didn't really talk about this earlier. But you don't really want a board board game like you, boards take room and those big round banquet hall tables are not going to be the best if no one can reach the board. So something you can pass around, right? Right. Boggle something you put in the center of the table and you can actually pass the, the boggle thing back and forth. Now, this one does take a bit longer to play. Not everyone knows how to play bloggle. So make sure you have a rule summary card there. But I know tons of people that love it. Uh, just make sure you got your pad of paper, or index cards or something for people to write on. Here's also where I would recommend pens for writing. So you don't have to worry about having to sharpen pencils. You know, and this one is a great for a wide range of ranges, even though you may not think it is. But seeing what words grandma comes up with on a list as compared to little cousin mm -hmm. Jimmy uh, is just as much fun sometimes as, you know, actually trying to win or, or any sort of scoring can be. Totally agree. Now, I mentioned not really wanting a board, so this one doesn't fit that, but that's Blockus. Uh, this just looks great. This is another one. Sean mentioned the tactile feel. I used a different term, but the, wanting to touch and fiddle with it. Blockus hits that perfectly. Uh, you get your own set of tiles. You've got a big grid out in front of you on a big plastic board that's actually elevated off the table. Uh, every piece you play has to touch the corner of one of your existing pieces, diagonally, but only diagonally. Try to play all your pieces. Then you score the pieces you have left, and whoever has the least left wins the game. Like, my kids love this game. They could teach this one. And again, the bright colored tiles and the gritty game board really catch people's attention. Anytime you've got uh, tile laying, path building, domino, polyomino types of games, mm -hmm. they're, they're that great tactile and always pretty easy to learn and quick to play. And then I've got one for the Scrabble fans who don't want to have to worry about vocabulary and triple letter scores, and that is Quirkle. I've recommended Quirkle on the podcast many times. You could either use the base game or the Quirkle Cubes variant. This is another one my kids love and could teach people to play, but are just as good with adults. Uh, very simple rules, but rewarding gameplay. Uh, this is a family favorite, both with gamers and non. We all love Quirkle in this family, and it's one I will bring out to uh, family events. Next up, party games that can work great at a wedding. So what is a wedding if not one big party, right? So what better games to have than party games? Now for party games, I'm looking for event style games, games where you don't worry about the points, right? Where they're more about the experience. And you games you can play multiple rounds where you just keep going. You play round after round and sometimes you swap out the people who are playing. Now, one of the most popular games to come out in recent memory, mass market, available everywhere is Apples to Apples. Don't underestimate how much fun a group can have with this game, especially at something like a wedding where there are some adult beverages being crank. Apples to Apples tends to go places that are rather entertaining. Have the game out on the table with a few of the cards splayed loosely so that people can't help themselves but pick them up and read them. Have a quick rule summary or again, have someone stop by and quickly explain the game. Just be sure to stick to the original apples to apples here. And I personally strongly recommend you avoid some of the racier variants that have come out in more recent years. Remember, grandma may be playing with you. Or depending on your family or, or who's at the wedding, go nuts. It is your day after all. At least that's what they always tell you. 
True enough. I still, there's certain games I wouldn't want to see at a wedding. I, I wouldn't want to see them for fear of offending other people. Up next, I have Wits and Wagers. This is the trivia game that doesn't really require you to know any trivia. Now, the trick to Wits and Wagers, if you haven't played it before, is that you put out your answers and everyone puts out their answers. So you see all the answers people have given and then you bet on who you think was right. So you can bet on someone else's answer. So if your brother really knows his sports and you're betting on his answer when the question is the 1976 World Series, you're going to have way better chance than, say, betting on my answer to who won the 1976 World Series. Again, stick to the original wits and wagers if you just want one table playing, or there's the party edition, which holds huge groups. Uh, also, just be aware, the difference between the first and the second edition, the second edition has a better board, uh, slightly larger and a little more clearer. And also, I found uh, on Board Game Geek someone who had built a customized magnetic classroom set huh. that was fantastic. It was just, you know, big, get a whole classroom involved uh, sort of size thing. You had a, you know, it had a whiteboard you could roll in. Uh, it was, it, it was great. It would be fantastic for parties. That would be good. That is very cool. It's something you can even keep stored away. I like yeah. it. Now, Telestrations. This is probably my strongest recommendation. Like, as soon as I see those big round banquet tables, Telestration comes to mind as a party game to play. There's no other game I own that I have laughed more when playing. Now, what this is, is a formalized version of Eat Poop You Cat, where, or the telephone game, where player draws something that like gets a clue draws it then passes what they have down to the next player that player looks at the picture and writes down what they think it is then they pass the book to the next player and they see what the last player wrote and then has to draw what that player wrote and it goes around the table like to like the, the old telephone game and almost never does a telestration book come back to its owner and start where it ended or end where it started the game is hilarious drawing skill is not required because the rounds are really short and you don't really have enough time to draw well it is a fantastic game and there are I, it's one of the best i played for for party games and i think this is something like put one of these out every other table at a wedding and you probably get the entire room playing and sharing and showing oh look what this person drew and look what they drew just throw out the points again this is a keep it as an event don't try to win telestrations uh, a great game and you can even pick up a 12 player party pack version of the game now, very next, true yeah, sorry. But, that's a good one, actually. The 12-player party pack, there's, there's a little lesser-known fact. The 12-player party pack has sharper dry erase markers in it that are way better than the one that comes in the base game. Like, I'm tempted to pick up the 12-player party pack just for those better markers because I have the standard one, which I think plays up to eight players, and it's huge, fat ones that are really hard to draw with. Next up, easy-to-learn hobby games great for parties. I still think one of the most applicable games just because of the theme people everyone seems to love is love letter i gotta admit i'm not a huge fan but it fits right like it's all about love and wooing the princess right people dig that kind of stuff uh this one does take a bit of work to teach non-gamers but the fact it's only 18 cards makes it very approachable what's neat is you can even get a special wedding edition designed to be the party favors that people take home at the end of the night now this is one i would consider having um, having at any wedding, even if you're not doing the gaming thing, but just having a couple copies of, of Love Letter around just because of the theme fits and the nice little baggie it comes in. I don't know if uh, anyone I know went to a wedding and came home with a love letter. I might be a little concerned, but you know, that's just... <laughs> as, as long as it's not the bride and the groom, then they're all good. <laughs> there right? you go. Uh, another one, The Mind. The entire point of The Mind is play cards in order going from one to a hundred. How hard could that be? But wait, you are not allowed to communicate with each other. Okay, maybe a bit antisocial for a wedding, but trust me, it's only when you're actually playing the cards you can't talk. There is plenty of chatter and laughter between rounds. Now, I just picture this being a great game if you've already got some card players in your family. Oh, hey, Aunt Lucy, you think you're good at Wednesday afternoon cards? Well, let's see what happens if you can't talk at all. Yeah, that's a good one. I, that's one that I think we were if we would if it had it existed back in the day, I could totally see playing that one at like the Knights of Columbus card events we went to. 
Up next, I got Flux. I'll teach you Flux right now. Draw a card, play a card. That's it. Those are the full rules you get in the box for Flux. Once playing, you quickly realize there's a lot more to it than that, but all of those other rules are through the cards in your hands. No real teaching required. Now, I got to admit, I'm not a big fan of playing this with gamers, but at a social event like a wedding, I'm all for the crazy back and forth that can be Flux. The other neat part is that if you are theming your wedding, there are a ridiculous number of versions of Flux out there. You can probably find one that matches the theme of your wedding. Absolutely. It's the right kind of crazy card game and not something deliberately tasteless. Yes. Not mentioning anything specifically. Now, moving on. Nothing catches people's attention more than a great dexterity game. Now, Bellhop fans must have known this category was coming, right? I love a good dexterity game, and these kinds of games are perfect for events like weddings. They're exciting. They tend to gather a crowd, and they get people up and being loud and cheering, or sometimes cursing. Of course, these are often best before the reception, and importantly, before the alcohol starts freely flowing. Yeah, that was something I didn't think of when I first made this list that uh, Deanna pointed out. The problem with these dexterity games is if you're doing this at the reception, there's china and glasses of wine and stuff on the table that you have to watch out for. I got to admit, when I was thinking of this part of the list, I was picturing big empty tables. So more of a, again, between the ceremony and the reception kind of thing. Or maybe later after they've already cleared everything and everyone's had their cake. So, of course, the one everyone knows and many people love is Jenga. Uh, this one's up there with Connect Four for games people can't resist touching and playing with. Set up a few tables with Jenga towers and just wait. Someone's going to pull a piece sooner or later. Surprisingly, rule cards are good for this too. It's shocking how many people don't know to only use one hand. And while it might just be fun to play and not worry about the rules, there will always be that one person who gets uppity about it. So just have the rules there. And if people choose to ignore them, great. But no one's, you know, there's no arguments about whether or not you know the rules. You just chose to ignore them. <laughs> up next, I've got one that comes up anytime I talk about dexterity games, and I don't expect that to change ever, and that's hamster roll. Uh, this one, you are going to need someone to teach. It is not obvious what to do with this big w yellow wheel when you sit down, uh, since no one's heard of hamster roll except us gamers. But it's not hard, and there are a few more rules other than take a block from the bottom and put it on top. Now, I mentioned this game so many times for good reason. It's my favorite dexterity game. I don't think I have to share it anymore. Just make sure you have someone there that can teach how to play. I, I would argue that with this one, because of its rarity, it is well suited to, uh, you know, while well, have the rules there, but really put the block higher than higher than the last one. And when you run out of blocks, you win is all you really need to have. Uh, you know, yes, there are more rules to it, but you can get away with just that. Very true. That's true. Especially if people are just going to play with it. To just play with it, it works great. Oh, yeah. Now, Pitch Card. This is a race game for up to eight players where your cars are basically crokinole pieces that you flick around a track. I suggest having a basic track already set up on the table that's small enough that everyone can reach parts of the track. Now, this is another one people are going to find hard to resist and will draw a crowd. Once you see a couple people flicking, other people are going to come back over. Now, this one could really be a space problem, but... If there is room for it, go for it. Now, weddings are a family event. If you have kids, don't be afraid of having kids games at your party. Yeah, having kids game, kids at a wedding is pretty common. So yes, you should probably have some kids games there for the kids to play. But honestly, these kids games are going to be just as appealing to adults. I know the, these games I'm going to mention are all games that I have found myself playing many times with other gamers, not just with my kids. Uh, the number one recommendation here for drawing a crowd and getting people to go, what the heck is going on, is a game called Loop and Louie. Uh, this game is far more fun than it should be for a kid's dexterity game that you can usually find for under 20 bucks. You got a little flipper thing and you're trying to keep Louie, who's flipping around on his plane, from knocking over your chickens. If you have a lot of geeks going to your wedding, you could also pick up the Star Wars re-theme, but realize the quality is actually a little worse, and it only plays three players. I actually recommend the main, the original Lupin Louie. Now, this one in some ways satisfies in the same way that Hungry Hungry Hippo does, but you don't <laughs> have to worry about all the marbles and the mess in it, or the noise. Yeah, true. It, it, there's a little bit of noise, but not but that not clack, 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 yeah, the Hungry Hungry Hippo is not on this list. You don't want marbles no. ending up on the dance floor before <laughs> the opening number. Definitely that not. could be really bad. Uh, Rhino Hero. So 
if you remember back to your childhood or possibly adulthood when you used to build card houses out of playing cards, well, that's pretty much this with the silly theme. Each round, you're going to build up a tower by placing one or two walls, and then you're going to put a roof on top of it. The roof you place is going to determine how many walls the next player has to place. Now, there's some special cards that mess with the rules, and there's actually a point in the game where a player may have to grab a little rhino meeple and put it up on top of the tower, which just makes it a little more difficult. So this is this is more of a kid's Jenga, a little easier to manipulate than wooden blocks. Now, there's also Rhino Hero Super Battle with mm -hmm. more heroes to battle it all out. And I have heard that people are saying that once you get two sets, You'll never go back because you can build huh. giant structures. Interesting. Yeah, I'll have to say I only have the original. That's the only reason Super Battle is not on this list. I haven't actually played it, but it does look cooler because you don't just build up. You also build out. It looks yeah. neat as well. Now, speaking about stacking things, my last recommendation is a game called Animal Upon Animal. Uh, you roll a die and grab the wooden animal that's pictured on the die and then stack it on top of the growing tower of other animals people have played. Uh, this is another one like Hamster Roll where you win by playing all your pieces. This is one of the first kids games I ever bought my girls and one they still enjoy now. It's also probably the one I steal the most often from them to play with my gamer friends. Because what adult can't find something amusing about piling animals on top of each other? <laughs> So those are our thoughts on what you can do to successfully integrate some tabletop gaming with your wedding. Have you ever attended a wedding that had gaming as part of the event? Let us know in the comments below. So that's it for this week's Ask the Bellhop. If you'd like to read more gaming and game night topics like this, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on Gaming Advice, where you'll see this and other topics answered in blog form. Now, if you've got a question for us to answer, head over to the website and click on Ask the Bellhop or email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Now it's time for us to check in with those of you live in the lobby, our chat room. We asked if you had, if any of you had done any gaming at the wedding and wow, there, not much uh, has people actually have, but there's been a lot of talk about it and a lot of, uh, a lot of chat going on. Uh, Major Kayla had a medieval wedding. Uh, oh, that's they cool. had, but they had five bo five board games and played D and D. Oh wow! Played D and D at your wedding. That that's that's a different level. You, you need the right group for that. Uh, Poncho brought up uh, what about a Rubik's cube on each table to see which table oh, can get cool. closest to solve it or solve the fastest. Uh, and my my uh, variation on that was what if you put a different shape Rubik's cube on every table, and that way you could have people going around at the tables and looking for their favorite shaped you Rubik's cube. That's actually a cool idea as well. I did see someone noting about putting um, mass market games as centerpieces, which pens is another cool idea. Yeah, pens and score sheet pads as favors. Uh, oh, that's cool. Yep. Oh, you could do your invitation as a score pad. Yeah. That could be cool too. Yeah. Very cool ideas. Thank you very much. You can continue to talk about this topic, but we are going to move on. We are growing through the support of fans like you. So if you haven't yet, please take a minute to subscribe, like, rate, review, click on the bell, thumbs up, or share to your friends. Wherever and however you find us, you can help us grow. Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Once a week, I'll be sending out an email recapping all the content we've released the week previous. Blog posts, new podcast episodes, reviews, and anything else we create. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com webpage and you will find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. Do you happen to listen to the On Board Games podcast? If not, and you listen to us, you should listen to them. It's a great show featuring industry insiders covering a wide range of board gaming topics. Now, what I wanted to know here is that I was on this show chatting with Donald Dennis and Bruce Vogue. It was a bit of a rambling show where the main topic was meant to be, share, be sharing older games with new gamers. Now, this episode should be episode 344 and go live on Monday, April the 8th. Now, there is a small chance it may be delayed one week. You can find On Board Games and other great podcasts like On RPGs, the Games in School and Libraries podcast, and Escape Room Divas at inversegenius.com. So the other day I was over on my old blog, the Windsor Gaming Resource, putting up a new blog post about upcoming local gaming events in March. As you can tell, it was a little while ago now. 
Uh, while I was there looking through the backlog, thinking about sharing something for Throwback Thursday, the next classic review on the site that I hadn't re-reviewed yet was Alhambra. But I honestly haven't played that in a couple years. So I'm like, I, I guess that would be my whole review is, yeah, I used to like Alhambra, but I haven't touched it in a long time. Then I noticed the next review was Race for the Galaxy. Now, this review was written over 10 years ago, and I wrote it having just gotten the game for my birthday in 2009. And I got to say, this seemed like something perfect to resurrect. Because anyone who's been a Bellhop fan for even a small amount of time should know that I am a big fan of Race for the Galaxy. I just hadn't realized that I've been enjoying this great game for 10 years in a row now. Plus, it was pretty cool to see what I wrote about the game 10 years ago. I was surprised to find most of what I felt then, I still find now. Though calling it role selection still feels a little weird to me instead of action selection. Now, I don't want to go into the old review here on the podcast, on the live show, but I do think it's worth reading. So head over to the blog and check it out. You can find that at tabletopbellhop.com. Just click on reviews and look for Race for the Galaxy review revisited after 10 years. Now it's time for our weekly Gloomhaven update. Now, technically, it's been two weeks since our last update, and that doesn't really matter much because we didn't actually play Gloomhaven last week. We only played once in that time. With Tori and Kat getting hitched, it didn't leave a lot of time for dungeon exploring last Friday. Now, the Friday before that, though, the four of us decided to continue the main plot. We're back on the trail of Jexira, helped out Hale, uh, who's going to try to give us her location. We had to find some kind of herbs or herbs for her so she could scry where Jex here is gone. So after doing some shopping and checking out the enhancement rules, which I got to admit seem really cool, but require way more gold than our party earned, we headed to the Vibrant Grotto, which is scenario seven. Now, I really like the scenario. It's it's I'd say one of my favorites so far. The map was much larger than most previous scenarios. It was not just three rooms all in a row. There were actual branching paths. And the goal of the scenario was not to kill the bad guys. And I mentioned it before. I really like it when there's more than to a scenario than just killing all the things. Now, in this particular scenario, the goal was to loot a bunch of chests. I think it was five in total. Now, the interesting thing is that you actually had to use a loot action. So you couldn't just end your turn on a chest and collect it at the end of your turn like you can for the gold. You literally had to have a loot card. So what that meant for most of us is having to put our loot cards back into our decks because I know I almost never include my loot card. Now, this may seem odd to many of our RPG listeners and video gamers as well. I mean, isn't looting stuff and uh, looting stuff and, and scavenging dead people kind of second nature for a game like this? Uh, yeah, it is. But the fact that you're trying to get the chest, like picking up the uh, the money is one thing. But looting normal, I don't know. I guess I'm just not, not um, what's the word, selfish enough. I'd, I'd rather put in a card where I'm going to do more damage or heal someone than loot. Now, overall, Scenario 7, I think, went really well, uh, though I did learn earlier today that we had too many potions, so maybe that's one of the reasons for it. Uh, we did split the group in the first room, which was a bit worrying, but actually worked out really well. Uh, part of that was one of the items Tori bought in town was a ring that let him summon a skeleton. So when his brute split off with our mind thief, that's Deanna's character, it was almost like having a full party with all their summoners. Summons, sorry, all the summons they were allowed to bring. I think they had a full group of five wandering that part. Uh, meanwhile, my Craigheart went off with the spell weaver, that's Kat's character, and the combination of me tanking and her damage dealing seemed to work pretty well. We didn't have much of a problem. It's really been interesting watching the group shift and grow through the various weeks. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't see it right off the bat when they were the wee little adventurers getting <laughs> smashed week after week by the early game. Yeah, I actually think in this scenario, we, we did, it went well enough that if, if we had to kill all the baddies, we probably could have pulled it off. But it wasn't needed, so we actually kept some things alive and basically rushed to get to the treasure chest. So this Friday, as far as I know, I still haven't heard anything at this point on Wednesday. We should be back to our regular schedule. Uh, so we should be continuing our campaign. And there might even be a special guest appearance, depending on how late the game <laughs> runs. 
You can tune in and find out what the end result will be at 8.30 p.m. Eastern every Friday night at twitch.tv Tabletop Bellhop. Or if you miss it, it will go live on YouTube the following Thursday afternoon for everyone. Uh, Angie Games is pointing out that given the cost of the enchantments, they're thinking uh, she's thinking those loot cards should be staying in her deck. Yeah, I gotta admit, once we started looking at the price, I'm like, oof, everything's like 50 gold to start, and if you already have one enchantment, like, you add your first one, you might be able to get that for, like, 50 to 100, but the second one you add, the price goes up for every previous one you already owned, and it's just, oh, it's, it's yeah, I could see starting to take some more. Maybe we'll just do some random dungeon just to make some money to be able to do enhancement before we go to the main game. No, that's not like we're going to continue on. It's been nice getting back to the main plot instead of overly difficult side quests. And now, Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last there. Here, what games hit our tabletops? Uh, every week, we like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we've attended, and other cool gaming stuff that's going on. You can catch the blog version of this week in review at tabletopbellhop.com under On the Table. So this is another case where we got two weeks to catch up on uh, due to the fact we did the, the breakout episode last week went a little long. So we didn't get to this last week. Now, what's interesting for me, though, is I basically played the same games both weeks. Uh, two weeks ago, I was at the CG Realm where I got in a game of Builders of Blankenberg using Fields and Flocks. Uh, and I tried out Cypress Legacy. Then Monday, I played the same two games again. So the only thing I did want to talk about this week in addition to those two games, is playing Carcassonne online with Sean. Now, I finally got the Birds of Prey crossover onto the table for the DC deck builder and enjoyed as yet another new mechanic was added to the game and one that I'd actually like to include in more plays as I feel it really worked well without overpowering. Oh, sounds very cool. So since my initial play of the Fields and Flocks expansion for Builders of Blankenberg, uh, I complained a bit about some the board being cluttered and some rule issues uh no again i i didn't this is a prototype so i am not playing a finished game at this point the rule book's not finished the cards don't have art and stuff like that so please take that into account while i'm talking about this so since that first play i've been in contact with the designer many times and sure enough we played extreme now there were some things we just played extreme we messed up but there were other things that the designer now knows need to be clarified in the rule book now, since that initial play, I have now played it with the expansion a couple more times, and I'm pretty confident at this point that we're following all the right rules. So it just isn't right if you don't get at least one extreme play in on a new game. No, it's very true. You can't not have an extreme play. It's, it's required. It, it's, 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 it's the other bellhops rule is you, the first play of your game, you're playing extreme whether you know it or not. <laughs> Now, one of the things I learned when playing with experienced gamers, that there's no reason to not throw Fields of Flock in, like full whole hog. Uh, there's no reason to slowly introduce the new stuff. Now, it does add a significant amount of complexity to the game. It's not so much as to be overwhelming, especially when playing with uh, an experienced gamer. Now, we confirm that in our game we played at the CG Realm because uh, Chad, a local gamer, was out. Now, this is the Chad who hates me because every time I teach him a new game, he feels the name to go out and buy it. And I got to say, that's exactly how he felt when we were done playing Builders of Blankenberg. So that's a good selling point there. Now, what Chad really liked was the mix of mechanics. Uh, he liked the dice-based auction system, the way the citizen track works, and the new worker placement elements added in Fields and Flocks. Well, it's good to know that it not only plays well, but shows off well enough to encourage people to want to buy something that isn't even finished yet. Now, the next week, I tried out Fields of Flocks again. This time, I did it with my Monday Night Gaming group. Uh, this was using all the rule clarifications I got from Cobblestone Games. And I got to say, it went much smoother. Uh, most of the issues we have have been cleared up. I got to admit, I am not a fan of the convent card uh, for multiple reasons, and I'm still pushing the cobblestone to remove that from the game. But other than that one card issue, I got to say I dig this expansion. Now, I do owe cobblestone and, in my opinion, you listeners and viewers an official review. So that's probably going to show up sometime soon on the blog. Uh, but I'm pretty sure we'll be talking about it here on the podcast as well. I'll do a final summary. Stay tuned, and I'm sure we'll hear more about that convent here. Yeah, we'll probably talk about that more. If they agree to remove it before then, I won't even mention that. It won't even have to be said. You hear that, Cobblestone? 
<laughs> so now the other game I have been playing a lot is a prototype copy of Cypress Legacy. Now, it's another prototype, but in this case, the game is much more close to complete. Uh, it's basically a finished game. It's just we don't have the player pawns. That is the only thing else. Everything else is production quality. Now, this is a board game that is part of this odd Cyprus inheritance saga. Um, it, I, this one's difficult to talk about. This is a brand that looks like the company tried to launch in 2015 and they tried to do it like like this big like the dot hack thing in Japan where it was just everywhere because there was a video game that you can now go on Steam and buy. There's a set of novels. You can buy a music soundtrack. If you go on their website, there's even links to a future feature film that's planned. Now, I got to say, I had no idea this multimedia event uh, existed until the board game showed up and I did some research before trying to review it. To be fair, based on my look around, not many people seem to know about this saga, despite it being around for many years. Yeah, now, I'm, I'm not going to talk about the saga. You can Google it yourself. What I want to talk about, though, is the board game they sent. You may have seen the unboxing video on our YouTube stream. Uh, this is an old school style board game, like really old school style game that includes a lot of dated mechanics. Now, these are mechanics I got to say I don't generally like to see in modern game. Things like roll and move. Roll to escape, right? Like that's think of jail and monopoly uh, turns where you can do nothing. So it's a roll and move. But if you draw a floor trap card, you subtract three from the die you roll. And if you roll one, two or three, you just do nothing. And then like not only is there a chance you miss a turn, there are literally a miss a turn mechanic. If this happens, miss your next turn. There's even a mechanic that's miss your next two turns. So while more of a game than say Candyland, that's not saying much from a modern hobby gaming perspective. No, not at all. I, it's definitely, there, there's a game here. There are decisions to be made, but there are a lot of forced moves. Uh, we did talk about this game on Onboard Games, so when you listen to that episode, you'll hear it. Donald Dennis made a good point, and he's like, I don't like any game that part of playing the game is not playing it. And that's exactly what Miss a Move is. Now, the premise of the game is kind of neat. Uh, each player is searching around the Cypress mansion, trying to find these inheritances that are spread around various rooms. The first player to correct the set number of inheritances then has to go find a key card. And that no other player knows where this key card's hidden. So they have a hidden key card to find. And then when they go find the key, they then have to escape from the mansion and win the game. But they still have to keep all their inheritances. Now, the actual gameplay involves moving around a board that just looks like a deluxe Clue board. It really does. Like someone took the aesthetics of Clue and basically copied them. You're going to collect weapons, assets, skills, uh, and other cards. And you're going to use those to try to find the clues and then use them to try to stop other players from doing the same. Uh, there's a huge player versus player element to this game where players can attack each other. And the weapons you find are mostly used to attack other players and steal cards from each other. So at least if the mechanics are somewhat dated, you can look forward to angering your friends and making enemies as you play. Yeah, it's combining all the best of Candyland, Clue, and Monopoly all in one. <laughs> now, that same Saturday at CG Realm, where we played uh, Builders of Blankenberg, we did play two copies, two not two copies, two plays of Cypress Legacy. I, I gotta say, here's the part that totally shocked me. We had fun. We actually found that to enjoy the game, you have to embrace the that nature, the, the player versus player, random nature of the game. Uh, as long as you embrace that the and set the expectations before you play, you could enjoy this game. Now, while the game starts off with players collecting cards and trying to get clues, the focus quickly stop, swaps to stopping the leader and preventing anyone else from winning. Now, due to this random factor, most of the game is reactionary. So there's no real long-term planning or strategy. But the point is, it was uh, Deanna, Dave, and I, we actually had fun playing this game. Well, and that really is what's important for all of these games. You can argue about mechanics and art and, you know, manufacturing, all sorts of details. But if you've walked away and had a good time, isn't that what really makes something a good game? So the real test of Cypress Legacy to me, though, was bringing it home to my Monday night group. 
Now, these are a bunch of rather experienced gamers who I did not expect to like this style of game. Now, it's not like we're a bunch of heavy gamers that only dig long euros, but I expected this group to turn up their noses at things like you're stuck in the e storage room because you didn't roll a four or higher a couple turns in a row. Now, my fears were unfounded. The four of us, again, had a great time. Now, I got to admit, I did sell it ahead of time. I explained that we're going to have to miss turns. And yes, you're going to draw a card that says you trip and do nothing. And you're going to collect the things just to have someone else steal it. So everyone kind of knew what to expect going in. But instead of random misfortune being frustrating, we found it funny. When someone was one square away from an inheritance and then found a floor trap, instead of cursing, they laughed and passed the die to the next player. When one player started to get ahead, sure enough, we all ganged up on them. And that wasn't taken badly. And one of the things I thought was amusing is my mom, who lives with us, we play in the basement. She's in the dining room upstairs. Uh, I came upstairs at the end of the night and she's like, man, what were you playing? It sounded like you were having a great time. And she wanted to know what was up because we were laughing so much. So I got to say, it's, it's, it's a mixed bag. I am oddly impressed by Cypress Legacy. Yes, it looks dated. Um, and that's combined with dated mechanics kind of stuff i generally don't actually think belong in a game but somehow in this case it seems to work uh it's like the sushi effect for a board game it's a bunch of separate ingredients that our own i don't really like but somehow when you put them all together it's working you know i have to say i was rather concerned after looking at a lot of the other aspects of this saga uh i wasn't impressed and it's not something i would have even considered picking up off a shelf yeah. but if the game is fun what more do you need? Yeah, that's what you need. Now, there was one other comment that came up that I missed. But when we had the game at CG Realm, we had a group of people come up. I think I was in the washroom or something and asked Deanna, oh, is this a new legacy game? So to me, that's just another sign that this company, because I, I had two theories for the game. One was they have no clue that board games have evolved in the last 20 years and tried to produce the best thing they could think of obviously knowing clue in some other old school games and they threw in mechanics from old school games and then came up with this cool cthulhu s story and they think they have something groundbreaking here the second that this was done ironically that they put it in that size box on purpose used roll and move because it's a dated mechanic and heck the game's fun anyway now i think deanna may be right the fact that they put legacy on the cover of a modern board game that is not a legacy game to me leads back to that ignorance of the modern gaming industry. Yeah, I mean, this this has been going on since 2012, I believe, was uh, the, the, the initial sort of rumblings that, uh, online about it. Uh, who knows when they started thinking about it. But, I mean, yeah. in 2012, legacy games weren't a thing. So That's true. It, it, they, they just didn't know, and they've, they've rolled with it, even though the, the word legacy has evolved uh, beyond what this game is using. Yeah, I agree. So I want to hear more about Birds of Prey. What was the what was the new yeah, rule? So the new the new mechanic they've added is actually and uh, sorry, Wat Watsi, uh, tapping. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> so you actually uh, rotate the cards ninety degrees at a time, uh, and the key is you want to try and get a card rotated a full three hundred and sixty degrees. Okay. Uh, and generally, if you can get a card rotated all the way around, good things will happen. Uh, there are cards that rotate things uh, clockwise. There are cards that rotate things counterclockwise. Uh, but the goal is to get a full 360 degree mm. clockwise rotation. Now, the, the the thing that people might notice is, well, wait, this is a deck builder. You don't keep cards on. Yeah. So part of it is you have to have some of the few cards that do stay out with you. Um, or find a card that you can, in one turn, get four rotations out of before Jeez. it gets before it goes away uh so it's not an overpowering mechanic because again there's only a few locations and things that do stay out the whole time mm -hmm. uh but what they've done is because it's so rare they've made it reasonably powerful so it's something that you really want to try and and aim for uh now apparently they've used this mechanic also in the teen titans uh okay. box which is a larger box it's actually a sort of another base game version of, of course DC, apparently um, uh, so I, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing that they do specifically say in the rule card that this game works very well with the mechanics of the team Titans. So I'm interested in seeing that, but I have to say this was the first of the crossovers where I really considering just 
throwing it into the main deck and leaving it there mm -hmm. as a key component. Uh, the only difference, is, the only problem is you, uh, without the heroes from that, um, the odds of actually rotating things and, and getting something from them is, is reduced a lot. So it depends whether or not you're, you're going to draw the right heroes. Well, I'll say one thing that uh, Cryptozoic seems to be doing right, and that is convincing you to buy more games and expansions. <laughs> well, you know, my, my son, my son is loving it and I'm enjoying playing with them. So I'm not going to do anything to play that down. We played it. We played again tonight, uh, not too long before we recorded. So totally fair. Now, the last game I want to talk about is the new hotness, Carcassonne. No, yes, I, I'd want to talk about an 18-year-old tile-laying game. There's a good reason for that. So a couple of weeks ago, Sean noted that he had finally sat down and learned to play Carcassonne on Board Game Arena with our friend Eric. Uh, something that in, in that moment reminded me uh, that we were sitting there on the weekend and I'm like, man, I, I need to start up a game with just the two of us now that Sean knows how to play. Uh, we played through the game. This was in that period where Tori and Kat should have had a board game room for us to go to because now if they had only heard this episode before their wedding, it would have worked. Uh, we were trying to kill time between the ceremony and the reception. And I was sitting there. I'm like, yeah, let's play some Kark. Uh, so we played through pretty much real time uh, and had a good game. I have to say the board game arena version of Kark is nice. Uh, it looks great, fully functional. I didn't have any issues playing. I never had to fight with the interface. Um, what I did think was noteworthy is Sean pointed out how different it was with two players. The, we were actually chatting in Facebook at the same time as we were playing the game, which is kind of silly because there's chat in board game arena, but whatever. Uh, and I got to fully agree because Carcassonne with two players is almost a completely different game than even playing with three people. Uh, it is super cutthroat. Like I, I say, Takedo is cutthroat two player. That is nothing on Carcassonne two player because with two players, every piece played, everything you can score is either yours or mine. It's my city or it's your city. It's my road or it's your road. Now, a big part of the strategy is trying to steal those things. So it's not mine or yours, it's ours, or even better, it was yours, now it's mine. You just don't get that feel, I find, when you play with three or more players. With three or more, it's it's almost, I don't know, Kart kind of feels like multiplayer solitaire, and everyone's kind of focusing and doing their own thing and building their own big road or their own big city. With two players, it just doesn't happen. It is in your face, and I love it. Now it's interesting. Um, one thing I'm I'm not aware of which uh, Eric's setting up the game, so I'm not sure which uh, um, he's got in there. I should actually look. Um, but the the large meeples are are that is that part of the base set? No, or is that an expansion? That's, that is that's expansion. one of the expansions. Yeah, I, that's the one thing I noticed that makes the uh, a lot less of the solitaire action in the multiplayer game is when you've got that big meeple. Yeah, you can drop down and say, "Ha." No, it's not yours anymore. Now it's mine. Yeah, because it uh, counts as two people. And take over and take over that city uh, and, and make a make a big play and big change. Um, so that's one thing I noticed because again, most of the time I'd just been playing with you know four and five players, and yeah, sitting down with you and playing one on one, it was like wow, this is a completely different game yeah. than I have played up until now. Yeah, I dig it. I actually really like Carcassonne two player. And if you haven't tried it, like go out and try it. If if you haven't played two player, it's I don't think you need to have a paid account to play base on Board Game Arena, but I can't be certain of that. Yeah, I'm but sure. I'm sure there's other online act, uh, ways to play it. Yeah. Um, so I am going to bring up the less shame more game challenge uh not because i played games off my pile of shame but one of the people who was at tori and kat's wedding was a certain han solo and whenever han solo comes to windsor he tends to have a delivery for me and i've got to admit the pile of shame is going up by one this week because my copy of immortals finally showed up all right well we'll uh Add that in, and apparently my button is not working today, so I will have to uh, make a slight manual, manual adjustment as we're uh, as we're chatting. Uh, that's fine. I, I tossed that in last minute anyway, because I was downstairs. I'm like, oh, that's right. Someone was here and got us immortals. So now we've talked about what we played since actually the last two weeks. Is there anything you're excited to get to the table in the next week? Well, I'm just excited to get to a different table. Uh, for next week so we'll uh we'll see what comes of that uh 
Although we might bring, might uh, see if you're interested in some DC. I might uh, throw that in the van and bring it down. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. What, what I'm looking forward to is Sean's coming down this weekend. We're celebrating his birthday a little late. I'm looking forward to whatever we play. I, I don't have any specific plans. Maybe the after show, we can talk about that. If there's anything, you know, we talk up on the show you've always wanted to try, let me know and I can get it prepped. Yeah. So we're nearing the end of the show. Uh, let's take one final stop by the lobby and see what's going on. Uh, there's a, there was a bunch of talk and confusion about Legacy in the uh, chat room, I noticed, uh, because we were calling it Legacy. Even before yep. you got to your talk about people in the, uh, at, the, at, the, at CG Realms talk, uh, confusing it for a Legacy game, our uh, chat room is doing the same thing. It's just, you know, you call that something name. Legacy nowadays, it's got a meaning. It, it clicks in everyone's mind. Yeah. And uh, there it is. I totally agree. Uh, the the if the, if you call the game legacy game nowadays, that that means something to a lot of people. I didn't notice that in the chat, but it's kind of amusing. I'm sure there's probably going to be listeners who have been listening to the podcast, like, "Oh, Cypress Legacy. What's this new legacy? A legacy game, kind of like Clue. Why a legacy game with roll and move?" And then they'll get to that point where I explain it. Yeah, there's no legacy aspect to Cypress Legacy at and all. Now, Tech was saying that. Uh, completely off topic part of his gizmo dispenser was damaged he sent in a request they sent him a whole new dispenser not just the part that he was that was damaged oh, that's interesting i could have tried to do that but then it probably would have just broke the new one <laughs> that's why i went with the glue but that's good to know it's it's cool that i don't is that cool many i think makes yep, that yeah simon yep yeah simon's uh, from what i hear very good about that i haven't had any problems with any of their games myself and uh, Dragon Gam was mentioning, uh, again, as part of the uh, Cypress Legacy confusion, that they just started uh, Eon's End Legacy. Oh, that uh, one looks interesting. Aeon's End is cool. It's it's a deck building game where the, the trick, right? Because every new game has to try something new. You don't shuffle your deck. So the order you discard your cards matters because then when your deck, your discard pile is done, you just flip it over, Ooh, which I, like I thought that. was very cool. It's a like very that. cool thing. It's a neat, it's a co-op deck builder. It's got some other weird things about opening portals or whatever. But like the, the killer app part is the fact that you do not shuffle your deck ever, which is very cool. I, I the problem I have with that game, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not even going to cut up. It's it's a good game. I, I have issues with how it was marketed. We'll put it uh, that way. I don't know. Can't always. Uh, yeah, uh, not the, the, the board game manufacturers don't always have a say in that even sometimes. So. Oh, here. Okay. I'll allude to it a bit more. I don't like when people put out a game and then they, they put it out because they kickstarted it, right? So it's released to the public and it's, it's a game and it's popular. Well, it's popular enough to do a second printing and then they fix it for the second printing and they change the art and they make the art better and they make the card quality better. And I already own the game. I don't want to buy it again. And they've done that three times with Aeon's End. Is there, every edition that comes out is better than the last and I refuse to buy it a second time. Well, I mean, at the same point, though, I mean, if you're going to put out a new edition, why not improve it? It's, yeah. you know, it's, it, it, it's I, I do understand. I do not. understand the 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 frustration with it, but I mean, as long as the game itself isn't changing, I to me, I'm not I'm not a huge guy about art. I, I'd rather I'd rather a solid mechanic, and if the art's great, fine. If the art stinks, yeah, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, the, they change rules and they improve rule books and different yeah, components. Yes. I don't know. It, it's, it's, it's a, like I said, it's a haves and haves nots. I'm sure some of it's not rational, but it's the fact that, hey, I bought this game. Like, give me an upgrade kit or something. And they never did anything like that. It's just, I'm not going to buy the full game a second time to make it look slightly better. Well, and that's that's part of the thing with Kickstarter too, right? Because, because as a Kickstarter, you are feeling involved. I mean, you are mm -hmm. supporting them and, and helping build them up to get to a point. And then for them to go off afterwards and, and you know, improve things yeah. and make things better without without any way of offering you anything it's uh... yeah but yeah thumbs up on the game play the game the concept great other issues they're not the first company to do it and they won't be the last yep and now a quick shout out and thank you to our patreon backers their support helps make this show possible misdirected mark join phil chris bob and camden every tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern as they talk games and game mastering. Brian Kurtz, thanks. Duran Barnett, thank you, Duran. Joe Swick, thanks. Jeff Seuss, thank you. William Fisher, thanks. Diane Tuzano, thanks, Ma. Danielle Thomas, thank you. P.S. Goujon, thanks. Andrew Dacey, thank you. 
Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock the front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. We can also find us on Board Game Geek under guild number 3347. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. Now, if you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com forward slash tabletop bellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night, 9.30 p.m. Eastern, and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us. Hang around and join us in the Pento Suite for the Off the Books After Show. For Tabletop Bellhop Live, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and game on.